Thank you for tuning into Balance Black Girl Podcast. My name is Les. I'm your host, and I so appreciate you tapping in. So this show is about all of the things that we're balancing in our daily lives, but the conversations do tend to come back to wellness, how we take care of ourselves, and how we take care of one another. And I am super excited because I have an incredible guest joining me today who I am just so inspired by and in awe of. So please join me in welcoming Tembi Locke to the podcast. Now, Tembi is a best-selling author, an actor, producer, speaker. And even if this is your first time meeting Tembi, you may be familiar with her story. Her best-selling memoir, From Scratch, was also adapted to a Netflix series that I know so many of you watched. <laughs> Just wrecked us all. It's such a beautiful story. And I'm so happy to have her here. Tembi, how are you doing today? Oh my gosh. Um, I am delighted to be here. I have looked forward to this moment. I thank you so much for this podcast and your visioning of it, your heart at the center of it. And I'm just honored to be a guest here and to talk and mm -hmm. sort of see where the conversation goes because I learn so much from listening to your podcast. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happy to follow your lead. Oh my gosh. I mean, I am so just happy to have you here and in learning more about you and consuming your work has been something that has been very necessary mm. for me. Mm. I would say I'm not always the best when it comes to vulnerability and just mm. like emoting and expressing. And it's something that I'm still working on. And I know it's something that you are such a <laughs> champion of. Like I am. So I'm, I'm like, for it. okay. I am clearly like the vulnerable, <laughs> like it's on my t-shirt like yes. vulnerable life right here yes um and you know maybe some of that is really truly how i'm hardwired i will i will bow to that i submit to that some of it is like me consciously leaning into it and stepping into it and realizing oh that's where my my magic is my grace my most expanded self so i don't i'm not scared of it anymore but i do like to invite people to join me there yeah um because i always know i benefit when people allow me to join them in their vulnerability and it just it inspires so much in me um so i'm here happy to have that conversation <laughs> good i think that inviting people into your vulnerability is really beautiful Something that I have been repeating to myself, I actually said it to a friend the other day too, when we were talking about just dealing with challenges in life and emotions and messy stuff. I remind myself like, this is what it means to be alive. This oh, is absolutely. the difference between being a human and being a plant or being <laughs> a tree. Although plants you may know? be having all kinds of feelings too. They Who knows? may. They but just express them differently. Yes, exactly. <laughs> as in the leaves fall and they're like, I'm out. I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, as a human, I'm here to cry and love oh, and sure. be happy and be cranky. Like we are designed to do all that. Oh, for sure. And in fact, the moment I do those things, I usually have more energy available to me to do something else. Right? Yeah. To sort of then see what's behind that. So I, it's a release valve for me and it's strategic. Like I can kind of tell when I'm really like, okay, it's built up and I need to sort of figure out what needs to get released. Is it a cry? Is it a laugh? Is it dance? Is it movement? Is it a sigh? Is it a walk? Because something is feeling heavy or dense energetically, or I'm feeling confused or like spacey. You know, I sort of have learned to tune in a little bit to my body and my like lived emotional experience to sort of like uh, take an inventory. What, what's, what's happening here? And then, and by the way, I learned that really through motherhood because you, I, you sort of do that with a young child. You know, it's sort of that um, stop, look, listen, like what are they, do they need to eat, do they need to sleep? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, well, what's going on? And I kind of do that with myself um, anyway. Yeah. yeah, that's really beautiful. I think children are mirrors to us in so many ways and that they have so much wisdom that as adults we can tap into. And even that awareness of seeing, you know, when your daughter was younger, if she needed something, was feeling something, being like, oh, wait, I probably do, too. <laughs> this is a mirror. <laughs> absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And And so in that, you know, vulnerability is to be able to say, I feel this, or I don't want this, or I like this. Um, 
and to have that, to acknowledge that for myself, right? Like even though the situation, I'm supposed to be strong in the situation, but I can tell inside I'm not feeling so strong, right? I can have that internal check-in with myself and honor the fact that there's a part of me that maybe is quivering, but I'm still gonna prioritize Right in this moment, I'm going to honor that. I'm going to be with that, but I'm also going to do whatever it needs to get done, and then I'll make more space for that later when I can, if I can't right now. Hmm. Does that sound like too esoteric? But no, it is a process. It totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think with regard to creativity, my creativity has been a learning tool for that process. Mm. Right. So it's not like I didn't come out fully formed in that way. Yeah. Can we talk about that and Ouch. your yeah. relationship to creativity? Because you have been in so many different mediums that do kind of lead themselves back to creativity. Have you always been creative? Is it something that's evolved over time? Um, yeah, I definitely have always been creative. In, in, and what I mean, I think we all are. I think I was blessed enough to have parents who allowed the space for it. A let me prioritize it, right? And I'm talking like very early, young, like just playing as a kid. Um, and I also looked up and I realized, well, you know, I have very professional parents, business owner, attorney. And I was like, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> it is wonderful. <laughs> and yet and still, <laughs> maybe I want to do something different. Um and I'm going to say, but for their their example, right, I don't know that I would have been able to make this choice, meaning they had done enough hard lifting that allowed me to have play. And I always want to acknowledge, like, the generation before us. I think my parents are deeply creative people. I don't think they grew up in a time when they could have chosen it as a profession. The channels just weren't there. So being a lawyer is an incredibly creative thing, how you approach the law, how you represent your clients. My mother is a business owner, is an entrepreneur, incredibly creative. But they weren't in the professional, in the arts, let's say. So me to have a career, a life, a profession in the arts was a bold, brave, uncharted path for me. That was really me following my heart. And it started with like, I want to be in that. I saw TV and I was like, I want to be in that. Whatever that thing is, I want, I want, they look like they're having a lot of fun. So I imagined a career for myself as an actor. And that brought me to Hollywood. And I was blessed enough to sort of like book my first audition and I was off to the races. And um, have had and still continue to have a beautiful career and I love that work, right? It's foundational to everything about how I understand the world and make sense of human behavior and express myself. And I just love, love, love it. And somewhere along the way, I'm sort of like fast tracking my, you know, sort of arc here. Yeah, love it. Um, I found that I was also taking pictures, doing a lot of photography. I was painting at periods uh, during episodes of my life. I was, and then I started writing. And I was doing them not because I had the goal of a professional pursuit. In fact, quite the contrary, I was very, I kept them very quiet and almost didn't share them because I was, I, you're sort of like, oh, you can't do like, oh, no one will take me seriously or, oh, I, I'm just X, just an actor, right? And so it was really just for me. And often when there were periods and anybody who's, you know, I'm sure you've interviewed other actors on this, on your podcast, but everyone, <laughs> it's, it's common knowledge that, you know, you can go through periods of time where you're not working, you're auditioning, but you're not like working. And so I needed an art form or multiple art forms that kept me plugged in to my point of view, my curiosity, my love, my imagination, even when I wasn't, you know, in a trailer and on set and headlines and hair and makeup. And I just kind of made that commitment to myself. Like, I'm going to keep my artist alive even if my actor is unemployed. Hmm. Out of that, years of that, by the way, years. <laughs> <laughs> the reality. Yes. Yeah, the real. Like, yeah. let me just get really real. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, years. Mm -hmm. um, out of that, particularly with writing, I got really curious about like, okay, well, wait a minute. I'm actually now discovering whole parts of myself 
that I didn't know, that I, well, not only do I like this, but I have a very particular point of view and I have a voice on the page that is very different than the voice I have out in the world as an actor. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do with that? Yeah. <laughs> right? And like, do I follow that? Do I kind of like pack that away somewhere? Like, what do I do? I am blessed to have a sister. Her name is Attica Locke. Go Google her. <laughs> <laughs> she is um, an accomplished novelist as well as a screenwriter. And so to have a sister, and we're very close, who is a professional writer, I was watching her unfolding and I was seeing like, wow, what is the difference between the practice of daily writing and being a professional writer? You know, and the struggles and the gaps therein, right? And she was the first to say, I think you have a book in you. So, and, 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 and I've said it before, like my, <laughs> we are really frank with each other. And so she was like, look, <laughs> write this book or I'm not talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> like a true sister. That's like true, true. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I took it to heart. Because one, it meant so much to me that she believed in my voice not just as my sister, but also as an accomplished professional, a professional in the world. Like, exactly. I didn't think she was blowing smoke up my ass. Right. Which I think I can, you know, I can use a three-letter, four-letter word yeah. here. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, fast forward, I endeavor to write the book. And I write the book, which is a memoir from scratch, which you mentioned in the intro. And my life changed. My life changed. And I'm telling you, not just because all the ways that it became very public in the world. My life changed because I endeavored to do something that I didn't know I could do. That was my heart on the page and my most pure creative self. And I did the damn thing. And I was very clear that if five people read it or 50 or 500, I had done the thing. And that meant more to me still means more to me than anything because I know the bridge I had to go over cognitively, bravery wise, curiosity wise to get to the other side and have, you know, a 280 page manuscript. That was not an easy bridge for me to go across with no one, you know, asking for it, looking for it. You know, I just did it because I needed to. And it's going to sound cliche to say, but write my next chapter. I needed to see I need to follow this impulse. And, you know, um, the grief of not writing the book was greater than the grief of writing it and maybe it not turning out okay. I could live with that. I've, as an actor, I'm used to no. No is a, like, very familiar. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I don't, I'm not scared of no. No doesn't make me run makes me go, okay, what can I do differently? What do I need to do? Is this really for me? But it doesn't make me just like stop doing something. And so I didn't want to feel the grief of an un... I didn't want to look back and be like, God, what if I had written the thing that I kind of always had wanted? I just didn't want to look back on it, you know? Does that resonate? Oh my gosh, resonates. I feel like I was talking so, so hard. Much. I'm no, sorry. no, that was that incredible. Was a, that was a tear. <laughs> it was an incredible tear. There's so many things that you said that I want to like dig back into, mm-hmm. which we will. But that last piece about the grief of of not trying being bigger than like that fear of how will it turn out is major. For sure. And I will say my training as an actor has taught me I live in rehearsal. Like I live in a rehearsal space. I am less attached to what the outcome will look like, what the final production and accolades and like red carpet looks like, that is not my focus. I know that I will get there if I stay in the rehearsal process, keep my head down, do the work, um, find something in it that's expansive for me. And so, yeah, I just... Like, that's kind of always my default. And I think it's just my training as an actor is like, you cannot be on the first day of rehearsal worried about the opening night. Like, you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to be stuck and scared and paranoid and fearful. And it's just like, oh, okay, well, let's start at act one. What's first line say? (laughs) Okay, what's some blocking, you know, and just get in there. Being present in that rehearsal process because we're all, that's what it all is. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now one would say, what are we rehearsing for in life? I don't know. You know, <laughs> But I would say we're kind of always in this evolution and process of discovery and learning. And, you know, that's kind of what we're here for. Absolutely. Creatively, certainly yeah. as creators. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, when you got the idea to do this podcast, did it look like this day one? No. Mm-mm. Oh, my gosh. So different. Felt so different. <laughs> How did it feel? I felt excited my origin story of the podcast was i went from idea to launch in 10 days so i was sitting at my job at the time got the idea for it and immediately you know bought balanceblackgirl.com immediately went on amazon ordered a microphone and googled everything i could about podcasts in a week and then you know a week after that it it was out and I've never done anything like okay, that. Okay, see, I know <laughs> you and I, I could talk about this moment for like all day long. <laughs> this is fascinating. And I love it because I have similar, I have I have ways that I can relate in my own life. Yeah. Of like where it becomes, the idea hits so clearly and there's just no turning back. Yeah. What's an example of when that happened for well, you? Well, I mean, a little bit. It's a longer gestation period, but certainly when the idea to write the book hit really hard, I was like, mm-hmm, done. Going back, I was in New York, like waiting tables and being host. I was a hostess at like a hotel a bar. And and um, I got a call from an agent. I had been in an acting class and he said, look, you can come to L.A., but I need you to come like now because pilot season's about to start. So you need to get here. And I think it was like early August. And he was literally like, can you be here by the end of lab- b- at the end of Labor Day weekend? And I was like, huh? <laughs> I was like, how many times am I going to get this call in my life? So, yeah. And I literally, I don't, like, in three weeks, was like, pack up, got a car, figured it out, and was in L.A. And changed my life, right? Didn't falter, didn't think, like, oh, no, I just, it was very clear this was the next step. And when I also got the call from Hello Sunshine, Reese's Book Club, about... Um, when they asked to see my manuscript. What I an mean, incredible call. Oh my God. <laughs> and I was so nervous because I was like, what, what, what? Who? They're going to read this thing? Like, I, I'm not even published yet. What? So, but I knew. And then again, I was like, well, I like it. I did it for me. They'll read it. If they like it, great. If they don't, I've still won. Because I did it for me. Yes. So you did this podcast for you, and we all get to be the beneficiaries of it. Right? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Oh, my God. That I'm, like, ready to <laughs> tear up. Well, it's, it's for real. <laughs> we had a time in life, and in this sort of iteration of America and American culture and, 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 and this generation – We are asking ourselves about, as women and as black women, our wellness, our health, our mental well-being, balance, and what does that look like specifically for us? Exactly. At this moment in time, that conversation could not have been, no one was, it wasn't being had 10 years ago. It wasn't ready for it. Culture wasn't ready for it. We had not, and so we're here now, and so you were providing a platform to have this very vital conversation because I ask myself these questions all the time in order to do all the creative work I want to do I recognize the need for wellness and balance in a way that I didn't a decade ago even I was just like just plug go hustle hard do it push I try to avoid those (laughs) those words now absolutely yeah definitely you also talked about when you were getting into writing even starting your book that you did it for you which I think is just like I it just made me so happy to hear you say that and what is so refreshing about that is I do think we're in a space where a lot of us are just used to being consumed and maybe it's you know like social media the Mm. online space we do create and do a lot of things Mm -hmm. thinking about the reception (sighs) What helps you stay grounded in creating for you? Mm. Fantastic question. Um, And we, there should be whole dissertations, (laughs) (laughs) basically, (laughs) on the way we live in a time wherein people feel it is natural 
to have their life constantly consumed, right? And I'm not going to say I am here to, in a cogent way, have, you know, deep musings about that. I sort of have a felt sense that um, we have to really be mindful of that. Having spent most of my or a good portion of my adult life when there was no social media, I have a lived imprint, a lived experience of the opposite. So I can be very strategic, if you will, to use that word, or um, intentional is another way of saying it, in what parts of my life are available for consumption and why, and what parts are not, and why. And that is an ongoing conversation that many people don't even think about. It is just, there's a whole, and including like my daughter's generation, growing up thinking, like, well, you just, people just consume your life. Like, mm, 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 just, just, oop, not really. <laughs> and so, and that's a strange thing to say coming from a memoirist. <laughs> right? I wrote a <laughs> memoir. <Yeah. laughs> We're literally like, hey guys, hang out for 280 pages. Your, your in, entire heart. In my heart and yeah. in my life. But yet a memoir is not my entire life. Yeah. And not everything about my life was up for consumption in that memoir. And what was the purpose of that memoir? What was my why? And if there was not a compelling why, I'm not going to do it. It's not just for, you know, shits and giggles. Just like, oh, yeah, my life's so great here. No. I mean, when I read great memoir, and I love the genre, by the way, because I like, much like this podcast, I like intimate first-person storytelling. I just love it. I love it in a memoir. I love it in a podcast. I love it in a one-woman show. I just love it. So, but what I love about memoir is that those are stories of men or women who have had a lived experience that was life-altering. So they're, it's hinging on a lived experience. They saw their way through it. Hell, high water, all the things. And they lived to tell the tale, and they are now asking you to sit around the campfire with them while they tell you what happened, why, what they learned, and they're offering it back to the community. So when I read a book like that, and it changes my life, because somebody's story, by the way, could be in a different part of the world, different age, different you know, uh, gender, race, all that, but there's something, there's a human thread in that story that opens my heart and mind about how I want to be in the world. So when I was thinking about writing a memoir, I was like, well, that's a pretty high bar, Tenby. Like you have to kind of, in order to do it, it's not just because I think my story is so interesting. I married an Italian chef. Oh, you know, romance, Italy. It wasn't that. It was like, there's a story here that I need to write one for myself, first and foremost. But also, maybe there's something that I know about the experience of love, loss, grief, motherhood, caregiving, that I could offer up in an artful form that someone might read, and it may be helpful to them, may not be, and that's totally fine. So that was my why, but I don't put everything out there. I don't do it in social media. I, you know, in, in endeavoring to write another project, I'm not gonna put it, it's usually like there's something specific, one area that I'm noodling around that I'm trying to understand better in my own lived experience and writing about it is a way of understanding it better. And so the artist in me wants to write about it artfully that someone might read it and go, hmm. So yeah, I don't think everything needs to be consumed. In fact, I think it sometimes would be cool like <laughs> if everybody would go quiet a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Quite frankly, I'll be, I'm, I'll be honest. Agree. Not every, mm, what? Yeah. No. Just that discernment of what am I sharing? Why am I sharing it? What am I hoping either myself or other people get from this? And even just that gut check can be helpful. Yeah. And you know, it's funny going back to like the days of the early, oof, I guess like early 2010s, teens, I don't know if you say it. Um, there were lots of, er in the early blogging day, or like the late aughts, like the early blogging days, and people were putting just whole 
thing. They were early essayists, basically were essayists, putting it online with no context often. And I was always like, that is a lot. I would never do that. And then I had to ask myself, well, why wouldn't I do it? And I thought, because I feel like I like a long form, uh, I like long form storytelling. And I like it to have an arc and a beginning and a middle and end. And I also think that's my training as like an actor and from theater and all the things, right? <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, I don't think I want just bits and bobbles out there in the world. I don't think, you know? So that was, anyway, that's a very long <laughs> way of, of, of exploring that. But I think it's, if we're constantly looking outward and our gaze is outward, that takes a lot of energy. And that means energy that you are not allocating to look inward. And I know that if I spend time quietly with myself, unpacking it, and by the way, that can be with my therapist or a close friend, but it's just not for public consumption, I am a more grounded and balanced <laughs> Black girl. <laughs> we <Quite laughs> love to hear. Because if I'm out there all the time, wow, whoa, what, huh? Mm-mm, no, ouch. Ouch. Yeah, and relating back to what we were saying at the beginning about vulnerability and understanding your feelings and processing, it's hard to do that if you constantly have just the voices and opinions and perceptions of other people all the time, you don't even know what you're feeling or processing on the inside. Mm -mm. Don't be up in the comments. <laughs> yeah, don't. <laughs> comment sections, we should stay stay, oh, stay out yeah. of comments for self-care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. So as you are going through the process of writing your book and even working on the on-screen adaptation, I'm sure that there were a lot of moments that you were reliving sure some really beautiful and also some that were really painful to experience and recall again how were you taking care of yourself during those times and how did you navigate the feelings that would come up as you were reliving experiences yeah so you're specifically speaking you know so here i have a lived experience and and i may have provided should have probably provided a bit of context you know my memoir for people who have not seen the show or read the book is about um in part, it is a beautiful love story with my late husband, who was an Italian chef. But also, it is about my journey as his cancer caregiver. And in the book, specifically about the first three years after his passing, as I had to rebuild my life as a widow and as a solo parent. And I did that in part by forging a relationship with his mother-in-law with whom I had been previously estranged at a certain point, right? Early in our in our relationship. So that's the nature of the book. It's not light, it's not a light walk in the park in a lot of senses, but it's also it's also about food and sensuality and love and sex and all these other fun things too. So living it was hard and also beautiful. Writing about it was hard and also beautiful. And then I endeavored to do it again for screen and now invite in 200 other people <laughs> to come along for the ride. And we are reliving it like in the 3D with actors in costumes, often in costumes that look identical to costumes that like, you know, my late husband wore or that I wore or my daughter. And so I am emotionally re-triggered. I am reliving. It is repassing over memory, repassing um, joy, love, sensuality, the depths of pain and confusion. I knew going into the production that I had to arm myself <laughs> with like every tool I could find in the toolbox. I was shivering. I was like, what is gonna, what's gonna happen? You know, because we're about to go there. Now, I had the blessing of being doing this in a very safe context, if you will. I'm partnered with my sister as the showrunner and as the executive producer of our show. Um, I'm working with Hello Sunshine, a female-led company, right? And I'm working with Nzinga Stewart, black female director. I've got Zoe Saldana, 
who is stepping into this role and brings her own lived experience around grief, loss, and feels very connected to the material. So I'm sort of teed up in all the best ways, right? From a like professional trappings, I've got all the support system there. What I had to do was take care of Tembi. Not Tembi, the producer who was gonna be on set, watching the things and giving notes. I had to protect Tembi, the woman, the person, the wife, the widow, the mother, who had lived all of this, right? Who was not a professional there on set, who was just like the woman who was like, wait, what is actually happening? How are, what, what, is, what am I looking at here? Um, so I have a therapist and have always had, like, I feel like I've always had a therapist since my, probably since my like late 20s, early 30s, I think I began therapy, so therapy. I um, had built-in rest days to just recalibrate. I had days when I knew that we would be covering some pretty deep emotional terrain. And I was in agreement with my sister and the whole production team. If I needed to say, I can't be there today, we're all good with that. Okay? Yep. So boundaries that are um, being established based on what do I need to bring my highest and best self to this work? And if I have nothing to offer because my cup is empty or there's nothing there, then I need to step away, fill it up again, and see what I have to offer, right? So rest, therapy, boundaries, um, and then, I was in constant dialogue with my late husband. And what, that's going to sound really weird and esoteric and no, strange to beautiful. say, but anybody who's lost somebody that they love, they will be the first to tell you, uh-uh, you, you don't stop loving them and you're still talking to them. And so I was like, how did we get here, honey? <laughs> you know? And to help me, help me, help me, help me see what I can't see. Help me see the grace and joy. Help me see the magic. Uh, with the days when I'm scared and triggered and all those things. So like having that open hearted space for myself was really important as well. Um, and then I had friends who checked in on me. I am remarried, repartnered, and my husband was right there every day. Be like, dinner is on the table for you. I know you are doing amazing hard things. So what do you need? Uh, or do we need to go away this weekend? What is happening? You know, so I think I was at a point in my life when I was able to articulate to others what I might need. And then I asked people in my life, people I trusted, what do you guys think I'm gonna need that I'm not even thinking of? Like I kind of crowdsourced it. I was like, what do I, you know, you guys are looking out, looking in, cause I can't know everything. I'm, I'm in it. What do you think I might need? And I kind of said, I'm, I'm taking, put them in the suggestion box. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm going to have to pull them out with yeah. it. And then uh, some days I would just be like, oh, yeah, my friend said do that. I'm going to do that today. So that, it was a real, you know, charcuterie board <laughs> <laughs> of mixed flavors and <laughs> techniques and tools to get through it. But definitely you don't relive challenging experiences um, without help without honoring the part of you that lived through it in the first place. And the gift of that show and the gift of those hard days when I did see things relived was I also got to see a younger self. And I said, damn, she did that. Damn, golly, wow. I'm, oh my God, I'm proud of you. How did you do that? Like, it was like a gift. Yeah. Who gets to do that, you know? So I was aware that I was walking some pretty blessed steps. This was not like a, I didn't take it lightly or casually. I was very clear, like, oh, life is blessing me twice here. I love that perspective. That just sounds like such a beautiful container that you had, mm -hmm. be it tools and community to be able to explore that. And even what you just said about kind of finding that empathy for your younger self that 
was probably hard to even recognize when you're in the thick of it and you're experiencing those things, but to be able to take a step back and have that visual reflection of it. I have been someone who, even though I wouldn't maybe cop to it openly, was I can see now hard on myself, just internally hard on myself. And I can now look back and go, I didn't need to do any of that. I didn't need to try to be a gatekeeper or um, a drill sergeant to myself to get the things done that I needed to get done. And I now can trust that's just in me. I don't have to bully myself to pony up to it. I'm going to get there. Mm. Um, And so I had a lot of empathy and tenderness for the part of me that I could see that was working so hard to do all the things. And that is, you know, that your podcast is about that balance, right? And I don't think I trusted in the balance. I don't think I had had enough lived experience yet to know that that was possible. So I think I had to just kind of like work hard at it. Dig your toes in and kind of get through it. So a part of where I am now in life is learning to trust more to um, submit to what I don't know and not be attached to what it has to look like and to trust my rest. I am trusting in my rest in a way that I have never done in my life. Like, for real. (laughs) I'm like, I might actually take a nap while we're sitting here. No, I'm just kidding. I won't do that. But you know what I mean? Like, I understand the value of rest in a whole new way. The pandemic be- began the journey for me. Production, definitely a learning tool around rest. And now in my life, as I expand into you know my own podcast and into the production deal that I have with Universal and other projects that I'm writing, I understand the value of rest because I want to do all those things because creatively they excite me. But I cannot do all those things from an empty vessel. I feel like you just spoke to literally all of us all who are hard on ourselves no. and <laughs> need to embrace rest. And it's... Well, let's just talk about how some of that is, and this is the podcast for mm-hmm. Black mm-hmm. women. Yep. Um, it's in the lineage. Yep. Yeah. The work ethic, need, cultural press toward it. We have been doing it for this country from jump it's in the epigenetics it's in the genetics it's in the cultural code it's in what our families told us and then we have it in our own lived experiences so we have a lot to like sort through to just take a nap absolutely and i am saying that because it is an awareness that the depths of it is an awareness i am just coming to I kind of knew intellectually a la carte, I could see it all separately, but I didn't see how it all lived in my life and how it is at odds with what I where I wanna go, how it is at odds with me being able to allow for my highest and best and most creative self to show up. It's not work harder, mm-hmm. hustle harder. That doesn't actually get me where I wanna go. Mm-hmm. You're speaking to my to my soul right now. I needed to hear it. We have been too hard on ourselves. It's true. And then I would watch other people like blithely do things and be like, "Well, how'd they do that? I want to do that. I want to be that. Like, what? I want a little of that. And am I entitled to that? Can I dream? And here's the crazy thing: you're talking to somebody who got on a plane at 20 and was like, I'm going to go live in Italy just (laughs) because. So you would think I would know these. And maybe on some level, on some level, I did. (laughs) On some level, I did. But I still had the imprint of like, well, I brought myself here. So now let's get to work. And actually, I did work when I was in Italy. I cleaned toilets in a bar under the table, undocumented. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) Because I ran out of money and I was like, I'm not going home. and, And I'm not going home. I love it here and I will find a way. I will work. So all the other girls on my program, and I say girls because we were all in college, young women, nobody else had a job. 
They had their parents' credit card. I was not going to call my parents for more money. One, they weren't going to give it to me. <laughs> probably they didn't have it or didn't want it. They were like, you're already lucky to be there. What? Are you, what? No. Come home. So that we were not going to have that conversation. And so I worked harder to stay in a place I wanted to stay. And, and thank God I did, right? So my point there is, I had the vision to go there. But now in my life, I want to be able to take those leaps and trust that the safety net will appear, trust that I can rest along the way. And, you know, in some ways, yes, I'm making it sound, you know, working under the table in Italy, cleaning toilets was hard, but I'm also in Italy. <laughs> right. So like the lifestyle mm-hmm. is still slowed down. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody still takes a siesta yeah. at that time, you know, in the day. So like it wasn't like truly bump and grind. Yeah. <laughs> like all, you know what I mean? Uh, I do want to like throw that out there. Um, <laughs> it wasn't like I had seven jobs and we were, I was working around the clock, you know, around the clock. But Again, I don't know where I'm going with this, except to say that I tr- I love the younger part of me that followed that impulse for some, a little bit of magic yes. that she felt like she couldn't find anywhere else. And I was like, well, I don't know what's over there. But that sounds fun. They have pizza. <laughs> like, it literally was like, they have pizza. <laughs> that was like, I can't, I wish I, I wish I could say that it was a, uh, you know, yes, I was an art history major and I knew I needed the course fulfillment and all of that stuff. But it was literally at a visceral level. Like there's sunshine, it's pretty, there's paintings and there's pizza. I'm there. Yeah. And I'll at 20, the at 20, great. that was all I needed. <laughs> all I needed. Yeah. Yeah. That path that it led you down. Oh I gosh. mean, incredible. Incredible. Well, kind of speaking of pizza, Italy, I would also like to talk about food and Mm. the role that food has played in your life and in your story. I mean, your husband was a chef. You also now have have this incredible podcast, Lifted, where you interview women in food. Can we talk about food as a source of healing? Why is it so important to tell stories related to food? Oh my gosh, I, we, yes. Okay, thank you for asking that because food is, um, it is among my love languages. It, it was so formative for me, certainly in the love space. I mean, to fall in my first great big love and have it be with a chef was like, it took food, which I always loved <laughs> and, you know, loved with my family and being around the table and family events. Sure, I love food. That is a whole different thing than being in a sexual, full relationship with a person for whom food is their prism onto the world. So he invited me into that space. So I looked at a tomato literally differently. Like I looked at, you know, um, ingredients in a different way. I saw the sun in a different way, right? So we spend a marriage and a life and raise a child under the roof. I live under the roof of that vision. And when he passed away, suddenly he w- that was gone. You know, he physically was gone. But the teaching of that, the sort of lens on the world that had been gifted to me from that relationship, that had not gone away. But I had to ask myself, how do I hold on to it? How do I cultivate it? How do I nurture it? How do I stay in communication with him? And some of the writing was a result of that. Um, me going into the kitchen myself and cooking for myself <laughs> was like a way of staying in communication and in love and in relationship to him. Um, and then being with my mother-in-law, who I write about in the book and who's also in the series, um, she like was cracking the code with me around certainly Sicilian food and her food of origin in a different way and used food to heal me. We didn't, you know, um, share a mother tongue, meaning she spoke Sicilian was her first language, English is my first language. I speak Italian as a second language. Italian was her second language. It's where we met in the middle. When we ran out of words, she would cook for me. <laughs> right? <laughs> Simple as that. Like, here, you know, when she fed her granddaughter, my daughter, she was like, food, let's do it. You know, and she was a woman of few words. She just wanted to cook and, and, and feed you. And so I watched the way she healed me literally in my most dire summers of grief and I write about that in the book and she then having had that lived experience with her I thought about all the ways my own grandmothers had healed our whole families 
and kept our, our, our lineage alive by organizing our community around the table, our common unity as individual family members. No matter what was going on, you got to meet up at the table, dispense with the difficulties or conflicts <laughs> or worries or fears or whatever, because now we're doing this. So I began to think about food in a very real way as a tool for families at diff in difficult times. And I thought about the way food was gifted to me when I was caregiving for my late husband, when he was going through cancer treatment and in the wake of his death and the way people brought food to me to just literally keep us alive, right? And... I wanted to bring all that into my writing. And it makes me, I have a very tender relationship with people who cook food and who give it to others. I just, I love that. And that can be in a professional sense or in a non-professional sense. I am fascinated with um, how people come at a dish in, in their own personal way and unpacking that. It just is like, a, it's, it's, it's creatively curious to me. It's like the way I, you know, when I approach a character or, you know, um, approach a, a particular story, it's very personal and I like exploring that. So the podcast, this season, season two, which is where I'm talking to women in the culinary arts and I'm talking to restaurateurs and chefs and cookbook authors and a food editor and winemakers and I'm like cracking the code to like, what makes you tick? What do you have to offer? And I only, my podcast specifically speaks with women because I'm really interested in women's lens on the world and putting a spotlight on female voices. Because, and, and particularly in the culinary space, I mean, my husband was a chef and it was very male dominated. And we all know, we've seen, everybody has seen now The Bear. And if you haven't, go watch The Bear. <laughs> but like women in the kitchen are holding the line and keeping the shit calm and are like, let's do this in a way that is sane, if we can. <laughs> and also um, maybe not so hierarchical, mm -hmm. right? And, um, so I like talking to women entrepreneurs and, and thought leaders in the food space to see what are they bringing that is changing the culture around food. And then I specifically ask them about what has lifted them up and who has lifted them up in their lives. Because I also am the benefactor of people who have lifted me at every freaking turn. There's nothing that I have said in this conversation today that could have happened without so many people holding me up, lifting me up, holding a vision for my life that I could not see yet. And so I'm very curious about the women in people's lives or, and it doesn't have to be a woman, but who has held you up? Right? I want to ask you, who's held you up mm. in your life? Who, when you called and said, I'm going to do this podcast, they were like, <laughs> go for it. I would have to say my mom, yep. which sounds, you know, so, so cliche, but she is truly just my biggest champion. And having, both of my parents are so incredibly supportive of anything I could call them tomorrow and say, I want to go to clown college. And they'd be like, let me find the next clown college scholarship. Whatever it is that you want to do, you know, let's let's support it. But just the way that my mom in particular really champions me. And I think a lot of that is because I had a very young mom. She had me at 17. Her mom had her at 15. So I come from a long line of women who were thrust into motherhood very early. What did they want to do? What did they want to be? Who knows? Who knows? Because it was pure survival. And so I think for me, moving to different cities and doing creative things and exploring different things, she's so supportive of that because she never got to you do those I things. I get chills because yeah. kudos to your mama and your yeah. grandmama. Mm -hmm. I mean, damn. The best, yeah. Damn. Mm -hmm. That is some neck. That is some visioning from on high. Yeah. I don't know what it's like. I was 34 years old when I became a mother. And I became a mother through adoption. Mm -hmm. I write about that. And I was blessed enough to have women in my life who said, it takes about five years of being a mother before you understand, <laughs> like, what the hell you're doing. Right, yeah. And I was like, what is going on here? Right. I cannot imagine my 17-year-old self being present, yeah. open, available, yeah. there. I don't know. I don't know. And so... Yeah. Your mother, because you are here right now <laughs> manifesting all the things, 
she let's give some shout out to her absolutely and to her mother wow definitely oh my god yeah. i love her yeah she's amazing she's as she can see yeah. she holds the vision with you she lifts you up always and always. i use the term so my podcast is called lifted one because when i was a caregiver um i read a great book on caregiving and I, it was a collection of essays and one of the essays talked about the need to lift your life above illness mm -hmm. when you're going through it. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I, I always like to repeat that because there's somebody out there who's listening right now who is a caregiver and who is so deep in it, so deep in it, mm -hmm. that they literally cannot see an aspect of their life above the waterline. Like they are yeah. in it. And that essay was an invitation to say there is, like find the things that just lift your life above this particular given circumstance. And that became my North Star. It saved me mentally, emotionally, creatively as a caregiver and as a young mom. It saved me in grief. And so when I thought about this a podcast, I was like, I want to do a podcast. <laughs> I want to talk to people. I want to like <laughs> learn more. And also I wanted to lift people. So who lifts, lifts us up? We need that because that's a, that's the way I think we get to the wellness and we get to the balance. Because I can't do it by myself. No, oh. I had to. For me, it's my mom, my stepmom. I mean, I you know they're in the they're in the series, they're in the book. It was my late mother-in-law. It's my sister. It's like I have a little cohort of close close friends. My dad also. My dad and my late husband lifted me up as well, and my current husband. <laughs> You know, partners are partners. We need that. Dear God, we need it. Essential. Essential. And if we are out there for a day thinking we're doing it on our own, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. It's better in community. It's more balanced. Absolutely. Yeah. We had a, a guest recently who's a friendship expert, and she had shared this tidbit of information that blew me away. Um, basically, is that there's been this 80-year study out of Harvard, essentially where they found the quality of relationships impacts our health more than anything else, more than what we eat, more than if we exercise, more than anything. It is, do we have people to be in community with? Do we have people to laugh with? Do we have people to bond with? does far more for our health than anything else, undeniably. And since I heard her say that, it has also made me approach relationships in an entirely different way. For sure. And I will say my lived experience version of that, no science or research here, just <laughs> one woman, one lived experience, is the 10 years that I was a caregiver and raising a small child and being the solo earner in a household and trying to literally just have my health insurance. It was the community of people through my daughter's nursery school, through uh, friends, through family who kind of held me up. And I will say, and I think my late husband's oncologist would say this, his diagnosis more or less should have been three years. He lived for a decade. Wow. With a cancer that has no cure, right? And I think that was in large part because of what you just said. It gave him a reason to live, <laughs> yeah. gave him joy, you know? It uh, was a place for him to say all the things that scared him. It um, gave us laughter, gave us support. Gosh, I don't know how mm. we, you know, could have done it without that. So yeah, friendships, mm. good, good. I gotcha, friendships. Not I'm trying to fix you, not I know what you need. Mm -hmm. my, some of my closest friends are like, I don't know what you are talking about, <laughs> but I'm here to listen. I see you. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. That is it. Mm -hmm. And it's so gorgeous because we're all just and I you know it's a thing it's a, say, a phrase I say frequently we all have heard it but we are just walking each other home yeah. so hold my hand mm -hmm. let's do one step in front of the other <laughs> and let's do this mm -hmm. and let's see what happens because you know I mean that's that's what that what is what is happening yeah <laughs> we're all we're all in rehearsal together 
<laughs> we are all in rehearsal together. <laughs> That's we are, how it and feels some of us days. bring snacks to rehearsal. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to bring good snacks to rehearsal. We are just in rehearsal. Right? Mm-hmm. This is a, we are, you know, spiritual beings having a physical experience for a period of time. And that is that. Absolutely. So, yeah, no. <sighs> we got to take care of those bodies along yeah. the way. Yes. Because they allow the spirit to do the things that it, it's called here to do. Mm-hmm. We got to take care of the body. Mm-hmm. Right? And that is not selfish. And as black no. women, it is more vital than ever. You know? And I am truly trying to walk that walk myself daily. What can I do today that is loving, gentle, and balanced for my physical self? Despite what the world is saying, despite what the deliverables are, despite what the deadlines are, what is the most loving and gentle and balanced thing I can do for myself today? And and by the way, the list could be long, but I'll just pick one thing. And my, I may only be able to do it for like 10 minutes, but I am... It is a way that is so deeply honoring, and maybe tomorrow I can add on. Mm-hmm. Like I try to come at it real, really, really gently. That's the way to do it. Is that the way you make you do it sustainable? It? Absolutely. Oh gosh, small bites, yeah. small bites, and what do they call it? Um, it's called habit stacking. That's what it yes. is. Habit oh, stacking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I did not understand mm, I love the habit value stacking. of habit stacking. Yes. So that good. is like so good. It changed my. It's changed a lot mm-hmm. for me. What are some stack. of your favorite habit stacks? Oh my gosh! Well, for me, it's in the mornings. I have to do, or I, or I forget half the things, right? <laughs> so Same. I forget half the things. <laughs> Same. If it doesn't happen before noon, ooh, oh my it's God. not looking yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, one of the things I do, like, in order to take the vitamins, right? I know I have. I've created the habit where I'm st- as I'm making the espresso. So window into my world. <laughs> as I'm as I'm getting ready for the caffeine <laughs> that is about to hit my system, I am like while that is on the stove. Stove, the habit that I do while that is percolating and I've smushed, I've, you know, put it, put them side by side so I don't forget because I will not forget the espresso, but I will forget the vitamins. <laughs> how so, our brains work. How, how our brains work. <laughs> so I line them up and they are right there with my coffee cup so that when I finish and then I have my breakfast, you know, I don't. And, and once, you know, I have food because I can't take vitamins without food. My body can't process them. Um, I'm ready to go. And for the longest time, I was like, why why can't I remember taking my vitamins? I can't remember. I'm like, because I need to put them next to a habit that I know I will not forget to do. So that you see it. So that I see it. So that I see it. And so then I think when I was trying to learn habit stacking, I, you would do, they said, do, you know, one habit next to another. Do that for like a week, I think, and then add another habit to it. Is that what you do? Mm-hmm. I so just, tell me some like of yours because I want to learn. Steps. I feel like my whole life is one big habit. Really? Stack. <laughs> but I'm such a like systems Oh, you are. Okay, I'm, I'm learning person. This, so I want to hear because yeah. I'm learning. I mean, it's everything from how everything is set up, from how my kitchen is set up to like the supplements are above the blender so that when I'm making smoothies, it just is an immediate like drop down into that okay, place. Your next level. Everything next from level. like the storage where I store, you know, my Kindle so that I read is literally on my bed and my phone is charging on another side of the room because phone doesn't go with bed. Kindle and reading goes okay. with bed. I need your book. <laughs> okay, first of all, where is your book? <laughs> Still in my brain. I know I'm gonna write it no, one day. But that's so smart. <laughs> that is so smart. So separating out the digital distraction mm-hmm. device from the one that's going to uplift and enrich and expand and relax is a really great habit stacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Pairing things in zones. Okay. So I, it's funny, I'm going to be redoing after many, many years, I am finally going to do a little renovating Mm -hmm. of the domestic space this year, as I'm also renovating other, you know, parts of my life. I'm going to employ your tactics. Yes. And I'm going to create zones. Yeah. I do have a, a workout exercise zone. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's a room that is just, and it's not like, I'm not trying to be fancy because it's not an exercise workout room. I'm not, at, I don't have that. <laughs> but it's like a corner of a guest bedroom that has all of the equipment that I need for like, you know, a little bit of light weights and my, um, you know, yoga mat. And it's just there. And so it's like that, when I go into that room, my mind now is associated with that. And what I do when I'm, going through the routine that I have 
is I will listen to an uplifting podcast at the same time. Love, yes. So that Love way it. I'm doing, I'm, I'm like, and, and I'm not trying to like, it may not be my most attentive listen, but I trust <laughs> subliminally that much of the messaging is landing in my brain totally. at the same time that my body is moving. So I'm integrating mm -hmm. mind and body at the same time. So yes. I do try to do a lot of like, how can I get my um, brain to sync up with my body? And so I that's again, I, I've said this a million times on this podcast, but that's the acting training is like imprinting, syncing up mind and body. So like when I'm learning lines, I often will um, practicing them with a bit of behavior helps the line to stick mentally because I'm, I'm, I'm habit stacking it. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With a movement. Mm -hmm. It's called blocking. <laughs> yes, yes, I mean, exactly. Basically. I think so much of that is relevant to wellness, especially as we're developing wellness habits. Mm. I talk a lot about creating a character. When people want to create better habits, and they're like, I'm just not motivated to work out. I'm not motivated to do this. Who is who is the character? Who is, I call it my Sasha Fierce because I love Beyonce. Who I was talking about her. Gym. Who is your Sasha Fierce character who goes to the gym? Put on that costume Oh, play baby, that you're character. changing my life right now. <laughs> and you're changing my life right now. Mm -hmm. You know what? In a certain sense, intuitively, I, maybe I did this in writing the book and I didn't mm. know it because I set up a space for myself and I got, <laughs> I'm such a dork. I got a book on the lifestyle of writers. And I think I got it because I was like, how do people do this? Even though I have a sister who does it, but like I wasn't like trying to peer in her bedroom and see how she does it, right? <laughs> and this book is about like well-known writers and it's their spaces and like their daily thing. And I was trying to sort of understand how the sausage gets made. And then when I went to write my book, I found that I used some of those tools. So I was taking on the character mm -hmm. of a professional writer Huh, yeah, I was doing and then, that, and you became it. And yes, then you became it. So it's another way of like fake it till you make it. Exactly. Try it on. Be the cost. Put on the costume. Yeah. Be the character. Exactly. So Sasha Fierce, that's for you and workout at the gym, right? <laughs> I think about it as kind of my like alter ego, you know, Hannah Montana, that back when I was first getting into working out, I remember seeing this girl at the gym who was super fit and could do all these things physically that I couldn't do. And I was there just starting to get into fitness, but didn't know how. And so I was like, okay, if I were her, what would I do? So I would go to the gym and kind of pretend to be her until I built up the fitness to be able to do those things, which is wild. You're dropping so much knowledge. <laughs> I am going to take that out into the world in like a real way and think about if there's an endeavor that a place in my life that I'm seeking to grow, right? Something I want, a place I want to expand into. Who's done it ahead of me? And what can I learn from them? And how can I model that behavior in the hopes that I'll find my version of it? Exactly. Okay. And that's I'm where you, you build, you know, those skills and that confidence. Oh, um, in a way, you know, doing, we were talking about creativity. In a way, I've done that. I think we've both done that around our creative endeavors. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you listen and you, you know, some people would say, you know, in the business world, they'd say, you do competitive research. <laughs> you know, who's doing it and how are they doing it and all the things, right? Okay, well, okay, maybe, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's really like seeing what has worked and learning, I've learned from so many people that I will never meet, you know? Yes. And they have left an indelible mark on my life and my understanding of ways of being in the world. And I think that's a part of even, you know, why I am a proponent of like, for black women in particular, travel. See the way other people are navigating this physical form in this lifetime, this globe, these cultures, languages, governments. Yes. <laughs> you know, how is it being done in other places? <laughs> Just so you have that information. Mm -hmm. You have that expanded view. <laughs> you have that expanded. You can bring it all back to the States. I'm not saying everybody has to be an expat. But you're going to know it. You're not going to not know it. Once you know it, you know it. And how is that going to change how you want to be here, how you want to show up in your life, you know, in America, in your work, as a mom, as a wife, as a, you know, creator? Um, and I think for me, seeing and seeking, you know, how have producers, like I, I, you know, now that's one of my jobs is I'm producing television and like learning from, you know, black women who are doing it and doing it well. You know, shout out to Yvette Lee Bowser, who is like a men low key mentor of mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Iconic. Know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, I'm just like, how, you know, 
we can learn so much. And so I'm going to take on an Yvette Lee Bowser character because she is fly. Yeah, absolutely. Yvette is fly. Oh, I'm so In excited to see you do I, this well, yeah, and see I how mean, that why unfolds. Not? Why yeah. not? It's very, it's very exciting. And there, we are blessed Although we live in a complicated time and in a time of so much where like you wake up and you feel like, oh, it's like, no, <laughs> the world is like, yeah, no, not, not you, not this lifetime, not this form, all the things, right? That is true. And yet, and still, we are who we are and we will wake up and we are going to look for the way seekers and the light makers and the light bringers. And we're going to follow that path. That's what we're going to do. Yes. Because that's how we're going to get where we want to go. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, it's like a beautiful mic drop. I'm like, Ooh, boom. Boom. <laughs> Temi, this, oh. thank you. So I just am like, am so excited to come back to this conversation. It has been such medicine for me just being a part of it. And I know that it will be for our listeners and just so appreciate sharing the space with you. Can you please let our audience know where they can find you, how they can stay in touch with you, yes. continue supporting your work? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Well, first of all, um, you can go to tembylock.com. There, all the things, sign up, newsletter, that stuff. I'm on Instagram. Tembylock is my handle. My podcast is Lifted. It's anywhere you get podcasts. And it's also on YouTube. So I think those are the places. Amazing. I mean, that's enough places, that's right? That's wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So we'll link it all in the show notes, make Thank it super you. easy for people to find you. you. And you can find the show on Netflix. Yes. From scratch. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. That is there. And my book, my book, yes. From Scratch, is also anywhere books are sold. Yes. And if you want to support Black female independent booksellers, do that. Here's a shout out to Octavia's Bookstore. Mm, mm -hmm. Amazing. Yes. Love supporting Black bookstores. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Yay. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for tuning in. So if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure that you're subscribed to Balanced Black Girl, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, wherever you like to get your podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. I try really hard to give a five-star experience and I would appreciate your five stars as well. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next week. <laughs>